Conversations on the Rocks, the podcast where the drink is strong and the stories are stronger. I'm your host, Kristen Dokas, and this isn't your average chat fest. Here, real people spill the tea alongside their favorite drinks, from the hilarious to the heart-wrenching. Each episode, a wild card. You'll laugh, you may cry, but you'll definitely learn something new. So grab whatever wets your whistle and buckle up. It's time to dive into the raw, the real, and the ridiculously human. Let's get this chat party started. Hey everyone, it's Kristen Dokus, and you are listening to, or watching, Conversations on the Rocks, the show that is unpredictable as I am. And today you have the joy and pleasure of listening and learning from Sarah Monroe. Uh, Sarah is up in the northern New England area, which as of this recording on April 9th, just got pounded with about 18 inches of snow while some of us were in 75 degree weather. And I'm sure she's kind of bitter about that. But anyways, Sarah has experience in many fields from fundraising and PR to digital media and even molecular biology. I'll let her maybe some other time talk to us about that. Um, She's now working with small business development and gender equity organizations. And here we go. Cheers, Sarah. Thanks for being here. Yes. Thanks for having me. Of course, Sarah. Sarah has an alcohol free cocktail, which if you listened to our friend Lisa Danforth, uh, in a previous episode who has a alcohol free business. It's very appropriate. But oddly enough, we're all connected. So not too much of a surprise. So we today are going to be talking about imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is something that and I'm going to let Sarah correct me after I say it is an affliction that is pretty much only something that women experience. As a matter of fact, before I even came up uh, to start recording, I was mentioning to Steve and he said, I said, do you know what imposter syndrome is? And he's like, no. And I said, well, that's very fitting that you don't. And so I kind of went through and I, I did the my one of my favorite analogies, which is, you know, if a man and a woman apply for a job, and there's 10 quali- you know, 10 requirements on there, a man will typically look at it and go, Oh, I've got three of those, I'm good, let me send in my resume, whereas a woman will nine times out of 10, want all not, at least all 10, but maybe nine before otherwise, they're going to say, I'm not qualified. Now, Steve made an interesting comment. He goes, well, I never really thought about it that way. He said, I guess as men, we're just told and have been you know, raised that you miss all the shots you don't take. So what do you got to lose? And I said, I'm going to use that. I'm going to roll that into it. So we're going to talk about gender in, um, gender inequality. Well, I guess it kind of is, but <laughs> imposter, imposter syndrome. And we're going to dig deep. And um, I think in the pre-show, we discovered we have so much to talk about. We're going to put it into two parts. So I'm not sure when we'll drop the second part. It might be the next week. I don't know. It's always a surprise around here. So Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. That's great. Yeah, this is this is a big topic to discuss. It really is. I when you mentioned what Steve had said to you, I remember um, it was a few years ago. I happened we happened to be talking about bullet journals at an event. And there happened to be a gentleman there. It was a cooking event. And he said, oh, you bullet journal. My wife is trying to bullet journal. Can you can you show me a few pages? And one page happened to be, um, I had just taken notes. I was at a networking event and I was taking notes from the speaker. And I had written and just, I was trying to keep myself occupied while I was doing it. I'd written in big letters, you are enough. And he looked at it and he said, you are enough do you really need to write that down? Why is that? And why is that something that a speaker would say? And he was so far out of the realm of even considering that someone may need to remind themselves at a time where they may be feeling nervous or anxious, that they are enough, that there's a reason why they're in that room. Because it never, 
ever occurred to him. And I have to say that has been something that has come up in my career over and over again, just with a lot of women. Um, and I, I would also argue with a lot of folks who have been underrepresented when it comes to corporate America, when it comes to policy making, decision making, leadership teams. There's a lot of people who are underrepresented. It's not just white women. You made an interesting, or you kind of corrected me and are brought to my attention, uh, something mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of. And that was that um, you made the comment that women of color, it's really a white woman pandemic, a white woman disease, imposter syndrome. Can yeah, you talk I'm, about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was in preparing for this show, I thought... I, I'm feeling like I have imposter syndrome about talking about imposter syndrome, <laughs> right? No, you don't. Even though this is something we experience, so I I may have may have taken a deeper dive than needed into all of this. But it was interesting. I was reading a an article from last year in the New Yorker, written by. Um, uh, Leslie Jameson. So if people want to look, we'll definitely, I'll give you the Okay, link yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. We can put it in the show notes. But it referenced some research from the 1970s. And in that research by Pauline Clancy, want to give credit where credit's due, of right? Course, this is that's part right. of the imposter syndrome right. fighting, imposter syndrome warriors, maybe we can call ourselves that, um, that when it comes to people of color and perhaps other marginalized groups too, it's, it's not that they don't feel like they deserve a seat at the table. It's that they're seeing that the table is rotten to begin with and needs to be replaced. And I think that's the place where people who may have more privileged backgrounds are starting to come to realize is that when we have, when we really think about the biases that infiltrate everything that we do, the privilege that comes in, if we really want higher quality work products, higher quality leadership, higher quality policy, higher quality workplaces, and engender a sense of belonging and inclusion, you need to destroy the old tables. And with that will come crashing down imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome was actually originally, here's the, the historical roots of it. It was called imposter phenomenon, where research, social science researchers were actually seeing that these high achieving people, typically women, were f having these crises of self-confidence. And over time, it became called imposter syndrome. And I would say probably accelerated in the last 10 years with the rise of all of the knowledge that anybody can put their fingertips on. We all feel like maybe we're faking it sometimes. Like if you aren't pale and male and wrote a book, where do you feel that you have the qualifications for speaking up about something. And right? I, th I think that's a really good point. And, you know, one of the things that we, you know, we want to share a couple, you know, um, personal experiences is I've been a digital marketer for over 15 years. And mm -hmm. back in the day, you know, then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, it became, you know, what was the old saying? Anybody can hang, a sh hang, hang their shingle by the door, right? Mm -hmm. And now, and I, I didn't, I agree with you. And I'm putting the things together with like, in the past 10 years, the amount of information that has become available. So anyone truly can get and spend some time on Google. And, and especially now with AI, you turn around and you can go mm -hmm. in and ask AI, give me, you know, a marketing plan, give me a social media marketing plan, give me this, give me that. Mm -hmm. And it will conjure it up. And to the point where even though I've been doing it for 15 years, all of a sudden, I'm like questioning myself and my capabilities, whereas, you know, five, seven years ago, I did, wouldn't even think twice about it. So mm -hmm. I was kind of tr not struggling to because I've had plenty of times where I've had imposter syndrome or impo imposter phenomenon. And but just as you said that, I was like, oh, yeah, it's like, yeah, so I, you know, somebody could do all that research, right? And then mm -hmm. turn around and come up with the same thing that it took me 15 years of experience to do. Right. And I would ask, though, is it the same quality? Absolutely because not. A, yeah, AI is still a toddler. 
right. has not reached any level of maturity and it's regenerating absolutely in some play in in some cases it's regenerating flawed information to begin with and then people are taking that and then creating these short form contents and and talking as if they're experts they just have a better stage presence than maybe even people who wrote the original pieces on this and they are taking it as their own or as if they've just discovered you know like they're Magellan, they've just discovered that the earth is round. (laughs) And I'm not sure what the opposite of imposter syndrome is, but I would, here's the thing that a lot of us know is Mm -hmm. I don't have to know everything. I just need to know more than you. Yeah. Right. So you have somebody and and especially with very uh, detailed uh, uh, professions, your very technical professions, if you're bringing me in because I'm the subject matter expert, you are. Re- I already know you don't know anything, right? It's not like mm-hmm. you're going to do the work. Where it truly comes in is if we're going toe to toe with somebody that's a peer in our industry, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's it's definitely an interesting um, t- t- phenomenon. I, I right. think it, I think it is better to be to call it imposter phenomenon and not imposter syndrome. Right. Right. And what contributes to it is the culture that you're stepping into to either as an expert or a team member. I've worked on one team where if a woman misspoke, I mean, it's, it just astounds me that this has happened in the last four years. If a woman, if a woman on the team misspeaks, just like I, I just did, the men would jump all over it and tease you about it. If a man misspeaks, it's like, don't interrupt me. I mean, it's that blatantly toxic culture around that. And I, it's astounding that it can, it keeps going. But I have to say, I love Gen Z. Yeah. <laughs> Gen imposter, Z. Yeah, yeah. Imposter syndrome, I think, has really just exploded with Gen X and millennials men and women i would say and and non-binary folks gender not gender expansive folks um i think it's exploded in the last 20 years with with our generations but gen z just cuts right to it and says what we've been thinking all along and i just love them for it and so. when you when you're talking about that are you talking about imposter syndrome or are you talking about the inequality well inequality is always has i mean Inequality, you can take back to the dawn of the patriarchy, right? When, you know, humanity used to be matriarchal systems. And you and I live in the United States, even when the early colonists in the United States, the remember the witch hunts, that part of that was silencing women. Mm -hmm. It was women were getting together and sharing some of the natural medicinal practices that they had learned from some of the indigenous people, but they were also talking about the men and that was forbidden, you know, that you cannot have these cults of women getting together. That is just, that's blasphemy. And it's, it's followed women through history. Even, um, I love you and I both before the show, we watched Reshma, Reshma Saujani, the founder of Girls Who Code, gave a commencement speech last year and recommend everybody watch that. I'll drop um, a link. Yeah, she talked about when bicycles were first coming to prevalence in Europe and North America, the freedom that it gave everybody, everybody who was physically fit enough to ride a bicycle. And suddenly, though, when you ride a bicycle, your face gets flushed. And they thought that there was an there is an epidemic of ill health among women because their faces were getting flushed. Well, really, when you roll it back to the the systems in place, when women could ride a bicycle and didn't depend on the men in her life for transport, she could go out and meet with other women and do things like talk about women's rights to vote, right? These right. awful things that, that were happening with women having the freedom to make their world bigger and the reason how they how they squashed it was to say it's bad for women's health um there was a time where in the early 20th century 
women shouldn't go to college because it's bad for their health. It's stressful. Women can't, women can't endure the physicality or the mental strain of going to college. And that's why women shouldn't go to college. Right. Yeah. So, so we can have an entire conversation on gender I know. And we can extend this, we yeah. can extend this to racial inequality. I yeah. mean, it, it goes, it's, it's really when we talk about the systems, we, we feel like we don't fit in. Imposter, imposter syndrome at its core is we don't feel like we fit in or that we know enough. Whereas we are in a system where we don't fit in. Right. So let's talk about <laughs> right. that. And we'll, we'll have another yeah. conversation another day about the gender Absolutely. inequality because that yeah. is its own, you know, and they do kind of intertwine. Um, but mm-hmm. what I was going to, uh, one of the, as you were talking about Gen Z, because, you know, obviously I've got three kids that are Gen Z. I have to disagree with you there because I've watched each of my girls experience imposter syndrome. And so it's been, you know, luckily for me, I knew what it was. I was Mm -hmm. able to play Dr. Dokus and diagnose, you know, I saw the symptoms I saw and I was able to diagnose the malady. And, uh, but especially like with my oldest, when she went for her first like real big girl job. Right. And, you know, she, Mm -hmm. in, in some ways she, had a legitimate reason to have imposter syndrome, but let's stop calling it that, right? Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a new job, a new career for which she had plenty of functioning ability to do it. She Mm -hmm. had like, you know, she went from basically bartending and events management into, uh, catering sales manager. So dealing with Mm -hmm. the, the business side of it, right. Whereas before she was dealing with the, make sure that set table set up and this and that. So the physical side of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but in her head, she's like, I've never done this before. I'm like, are you kidding me? You've been doing this for the past five years. Mm -hmm. It just looks different. So, you know, it was just having to make her stop and think, well, yeah, you haven't done this job. However, Mm -hmm. let's take a look at all the things you've done in your previous jobs that are going to benefit you in, in a desk job. Mm -hmm. So in, you know, I think it's just brief for all of us. It's just reframing it. Um, Mm -hmm. What are some ideas and things that you can think of? What are some, if somebody, or hopefully lots of people are listening, Mm -hmm. but what are some ways that as humans, but also as professional leaders, that we can either get rid of it or help alleviate it. Mm-hmm. So one part, I think one of the first steps is to recognize that everybody has a first day. Everybody at one point is new to what they're doing. Whether you inherit a business, you start a business, you're going into a well-established business. Everybody has a first day and recognizing that there needs to be some structural supports to help them through that. For for instance, your daughter, right? And on the personal side, remembering you were hired for a position because of your experience and because of what you can do. And you just may not know where where things are at the at the start. But you were there for a reason and they picked you to be there. And so letting yourself shine. Also, having people around you that will, what's the saying, that will light your candle, not yes. snuff it out, right? Yes. Like that workplace that I said, if I, I misspoke, I clearly remember it. I had said eight instead of 10 and boy, did they jump down my throat. Instead of paying attention to what, and I corrected myself Immediately when I said eight, I knew I meant 10. But instead of focusing on the next sentence, they just couldn't let go of that. So that building a culture that is more inclusive, that recognizes that people are, aren't going to feel like they fit in. And what are the practices and the habits that we've had for so long that that are really hard to break, that are in some ways, the implicit bias that we carry about younger people or people from different backgrounds or people from different countries or people who have an accent, right? There is a lot of bias that we carry. And the first step to that is to 
recognize what your bias is and to stop that. Hear what actual AI-generated voices are saying about the Wheeler's Dog podcast. It can be amusing. It's better than going to the dentist. The award-winning Wheeler's Dog podcast can be found just about anywhere that you get podcasts. Listening to Eugene is better than looking at Eugene. Let's put it this way. The Wheeler's Dog Podcast is better than having your leg broken by a lone shark. If AI-generated voices are saying that about the Wheeler's Dog Podcast, shouldn't you be a listener too? It occurred to me that there are things that we as individuals personally can do. And I think one of the biggest things that women, and I'm just saying women can do, is check your tribe. Mm-hmm. You need to surround yourself by other women that are cheering you on. And I think when you have a solid yeah. tribe around you that's cheering you on, that says, you got this, you go, girl. Why mm-hmm. you are, you're the, you know, what, if you have those cheerleaders. Right. Instead of, and, you know, I'm going to go back to my oldest. She, for a long time, had the little Debs, the little debutantes around that all they did was just tear each other up. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what in Sam's carnation is going on? I'm like, we don't do that. We do not talk about our sisters that way. We do not do it. We, there are enough people out there that aren't female that are doing that, that we don't need, like if you're, if you're, Sisterhood, your sister tribe, tribe of sisters, whatever you, sorority, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call them, squad. It, I like to your say squad. squad. Yeah, is not is not lifting you up. You need a new squad mm-hmm. because I think a lot of that comes from that. Like I can't do this. Is because you know why? Somewhere along the way, somebody told you that you couldn't. I don't think any mm-hmm. of us intrinsically just wake up and go, "Oh, I can't do this." Somewhere mm-hmm. along the way, we or you or they have been told you're not good enough to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And have you seen the Dove commercials that came out around the time of the NCAA basketball tournaments? Yes. Where that brings to light, it's really brought the visuals to young women in athletics. About how they, usually, what is it, by age nine, they've aged out? I think it's usually like middle school. It's right around right around puberty, right when body image things start to come up. It's the same with young women in math and science too. I've seen it. I felt it myself is that you have to be perfect, right? And I, I'm going to go back to Reshma Saujani because she wrote a book called Brave Not Perfect and where she talks about how we raise boys to be brave, to take risks, and we raise girls to be perfect, Yep. Right. You cannot send out an email with a typo in it. So you, we would set, spend three hours finding the last itty bitty typo and misplaced, you know, any kind of misplaced comment. And does this sound right? And does it, should I word exactly. my sentences differently? Exactly. Yeah. And here's the thing. There's always going to be a typo. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Even the most perfect person, there will always be a typo. If something is long enough, there's always going to be a typo. So just get over it. No one else is spending that kind of time. Um, and yes, I know there are that. three different ways to spell there, but if that all you took from my correspondence was the fact that mm-hmm. autocorrect didn't catch the, right. then we've got bigger issues. Right. Or autocorrect did. Have you been seeing this yeah. with your <laughs> predictive text? I, I was writing a word document today and it was catching on to what I was writing about and it was just filling in words for me. It's like, yep, that's what I want to write. Just tab tab over and it, accept that the so. uh brave over perfect brave not perfect brave not yep. perfect that kind of goes mm-hmm. back to what steve said uh when he and i were talking about it which is that mm-hmm. he you know as a that guys just go you shoot your shot right what's the worst yep. that can happen and mm-hmm. um i think that's another dialogue that women need to you know oh my god what happens if they say no mm-hmm. okay right. what if they don't then you've what got an I answer fail? okay yeah. But if you don't try it, guess what? You're definitely going to fail. Exactly. And exactly. it's just these are the kind of lessons, you know, that we need to, um, especially as we as, you know, the adult females. 
<laughs> need yep. to be coaching the younger ones. But I agree with you. I don't see it as much um, with Gen Z as, you know, I've had mm-hmm. a few interns and um, employees that are in that Gen Z. And I don't see it nearly as much with them as I saw it with us. Um, mm-hmm. And I was kind of aged out. Actually, I wasn't aged out of millennials. I was just parenting, <laughs> heavy duty parenting during the yeah. millennial time. But I think there was there was a lot more second guessing. There was still a lot of second guessing going on with the millennials um, with that. Right. But Gen Z, I think they're more like, all right, so what happens? If, I mean, if I don't make it, I don't make it. Big deal. Um, mm-hmm. It's the old, you know, you've survived 100% of the worst days of your life so far. Um, right. And I think that's where a science background has really helped me and a professional science background, not just not just classroom science, but actually professional science where things fail things fail spectacularly sometimes hopefully you don't have an explosion which i have had ones but things break things don't work i had a boss say why isn't this suddenly not working and i said i don't know it was raining today there's no there's no conceivable reason why this didn't work so we let's retest it try it again and then maybe then let's see if our hypothesis is wrong, right, in the end. So, And something um, going along with that, something that you combining this with the 10 years, right, with the whole mm-hmm. everything over the past 10 years. The other thing, too, is any of us, whatever we're doing in our work or personal life, there are so many extenuating circumstances that we don't control that, and just as you were saying that, I I had a client that something, we were setting something up and something, you know, on the other side, not hers or not mine, but on the other, on the technical side of it, it went belly up. And Mm -hmm. she was pretty upset with me. And I'm like, I can't control that. Like, Mm -hmm. I set everything up. I do the things when I'm going through and I'm A-B testing everything, everything is fine. Once it's done, if something happens to the software company, you know, ABC, there's nothing I can do about that. That's not a me thing. That's a them thing. And, right. But it's so easy for everybody just to, you know, want to look and point and go, well, I, no, you touched it last. I'm like, well, no, actually, I kind of mm-hmm. didn't. ABC yeah. people did. And I think that is an artifact of being consultants too, Mm -hmm. right? We're paying you so much an hour. This should be perfect. It's like, well, everything has an imperfect system. Internets go down, global pandemics, people get sick, childcare falls through, people have, have to take care of their mental health too. I see us being much more humane now. Like if someone has lost childcare or they're sick. It's like, okay, we need to recalibrate the deadline, figure out how to get this done before 2020. Oh, you have the flu. Could you, if you're sitting up right now, could you at least proofread this email? Right? No, <laughs> but the, the instance that I just spoke of. Yeah. It definitely made me question myself. One hundred percent. I went through before I came back with a response to my client, and I went through to to all the checks and balances, and I'm like, check, 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 check. Mm-hmm. But it made me go, did I? Did I? Did yeah. I do something wrong? Did, did I, I miss a step? Wrong? Did yep. I? You know, and mm-hmm. you know, I don't get imposter phenomenon very often, so mm-hmm. it's just funny how easy it is to slip into that. Whereas I can imagine that some body in the other sex would have been like, I don't know. Right. Um, Right. Yeah. I have dug into someone saying this, this, the email has to be rescinded that you sent to 5,000 people because so-and-so can't, people are saying, people are calling saying that there's a mistake and that this isn't working. And, and so my favorite line back to that, how many people? Right. And, you know, as a consultant, I got to say, when was it? It was when Sheryl Sandberg, it was before she wrote Lean In, she had talked about how corporations and businesses need to treat contract people better, that we're wearing them out. I mean, it goes way back to whenever that was, what, early 2000s, I think she wrote that book? Um, um, I think it was more like around 2010-ish. I 2010-ish? Think it was, yeah, yeah. I, I, I okay. don't think it was quite, um, quite that Y2K. Far. Yeah. yeah, but she was saying that we are developing a gig economy and that 
consultants and freelancers are going to be used more and more and we need to treat them better. That no, it is a system problem. And how many of us now write into our client contracts that certain things are beyond our control? Right. I, I learned exactly. that lesson several years ago. It's like, yep. it is not my fault if Meta goes down. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I'm sorry if Facebook is down. Yes, it's a yep. it's a trending hashtag on Twitter or X, but it's yep. not my. I can do nothing about it. Mm-hmm. And I defend a designer who comes back and says, "You made another change. You have to approve this proof." I I'm the same with our printers. I've had to eat a printing bill with a client because there was a typo in it. It was, a, it, was, it was like a significant piece that needed to be fixed. We had to rip a page out of a program and put it back in for an event. We had the time to do it. But I hadn't written in my contract, final proof approval means final proof approval. I am not the final proof approval. So I learned that lesson pretty hard, yeah. too. So the ones with uh, the ones that take money out of our pocketbook are always the ones that we go, okay, next rendition, w- yep. w- lawyer up and go, okay. okay. Oh, my light just went off and yep. now it's dark. I'm like looking, <laughs> if y'all can't see me, I'm like looking all Rudy. I know we're, we're, uh, you talked about the 18 inches of snow. Well, the benefit that we had was 50 degrees over the weekend and a total eclipse. We were in the path of totality. So oh, gotta nice. Say, nice. The, the snow last week was okay. The fluky internet, when we talk about things going wrong, it's like, yeah, I have to say, I can do these live shows as long as the internet is stable. And during those snowstorms, internet was not stable. So it's just like, yes. Those emails were all in my outbox. None of them went because internet went out. In oh, well. Storm. And did you witness so. a rapture? <laughs> I'm sorry. And I were it, joking. 20... How many raptures have we survived at this point? Right? <laughs> I don't. I was talking to, about this to my, my trainer today. I was like, you know, I remember you know, 2017. We were totality here. I don't remember anybody talking about a rapture. I'm like, what is going on? This world is... Go- I've start- I'm starting to feel old because I'm starting to say, what is wrong with this world? <laughs> I know. We, well, look at it this way. We survived Y2K. Yeah. We survived... Wasn't there a rapture in like 2006, 2008? Well, we survived the, the crashes of those times. Right. We're Gen X. So we've just... We've survived how many recessions? Oh, yeah. Right? Honestly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's why we're the FAFO so. generation. Okay, we are going to wrap this up a little bit. And then we are going to um, Sarah's going to come back and we're going to go into more of a instead of just an this is kind of like, um, this was imposter syndrome 101, right? Mm-hmm. But what I want us to talk about when we get together again is a little bit more about what businesses and people that aren't impacted. Let me say it that way. People that are not impacted by imposter mm-hmm. syndrome, what can what can what can we do? How can we support? How can we get rid of it? How can we support these women? And I also want to talk a little bit then too about just kind of up, continuing to upend this system that no longer serves any of us well. Even Mm -hmm. the ones that it supposedly serves, I don't think it serves them very well because they're having to live a little bit of this life. So in closing, what would you like? What any closing comments before we sign off on this? Closing comments, I would say I'll take a page from Brave Not Perfect and to say that everybody deserves the opportunity to take a risk. And to embrace some imperfections. And that is part of life, right? And, and I can say that from a privileged, privileged position and also recognize that there are inequities that I face too and that it's okay to stand in your own space. As our friend Lisa says, stand in your brilliance, right? Right. And lift each other up. And that, my friends, is something you will hear me talk about all the time. Going back to what I said earlier, it's like, you know, make sure you've got a good squad around you that surrounds you. And if Mm -hmm. you don't, find a new squad because they're not for you. And when you do need them, they're not going to be there, at least Mm -hmm. not to help you. They'll be there to watch you fall, but that's about it. So 
Till next time, my friends, thank you for tuning in and I will catch you on the flip side. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. As the saying goes, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And that's a wrap for this week's episode. A big thanks to my guests for sharing their story and to you for listening. Don't forget to share the show with your friends and spread the words. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, the link is in the show notes. Till next time. Cheers. Cheers.